believe. All things are possible for him who believes. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 27, it says, Jesus looked at them and said, with men, it's impossible. <laughs> but not with God. Come on, with God, all things are possible. Come on, all things are possible. Just say it and, and, and shake your neighbor and say, all things are possible. To those who believe. And I'm a believer. So it's possible. Let's pray and we're going to get further in this. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for uh, your spirit that's already filled this place, Lord God. We thank you, Father, that as this word goes forth, that it would go forth sharp in the way that you've designed it to go forth. It would go forth with boldness and with utterance from your spirit, Father. I thank you, Lord, that this would be a word in season, that this series is a series in season for Love City Church. I thank you, Father, that uh, uh, you're opening up the eyes of our understanding. You're giving us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to help us to understand what we are seeing in the word today and how it can apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Go over to Acts chapter 1. That's where we're going to start here today. Uh, we need to look at this because, you know, the, the disciples uh, at the time when Jesus ascended into heaven, I can just imagine some of the things that they might have been thinking. Well, here's our leader. Our leader's gone. Look at him. He's rising up in the middle of thin air. <laughs> uh, what are we going to do now? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, he said, In being assembled together with them. How many know Jesus was really uh, about getting assembled together? You know, a lot of people in the church today, they think, well, I don't really need to go to church. I can just have my own good thing at the house. There's something about getting assembled together. You know, y'all ever been, uh, uh, went to like a Toys R Us? You know, this is probably why they had to file bankruptcy. But, you know, um, you go in there and you buy a bicycle. They give you the price of the bicycle. Then they give you the price of the bicycle with assembly. Now, they don't do this at Walmart for us people that shop there at Walmarts, you know, whatever you want to call it, the Walmarts. But at Toys R Us, these high class, you know, people, you have to pay for the assembly. Now, in California, you know, we used to have Ikeas all, the, all around, and, and Larissa would love to go to Ikea. This is her store. She'd go to Ikea, this Swedish cheap furniture, you know. But she doesn't know how to read instructions very well. So she'd buy all this stuff and say, now put it together. Now, some people are just like an Ikea. They go in there, they think they get saved, and they go home, and they're just a box. They've never put anything together. Come on, God's put some furniture on the inside of you. God has put some things on the inside of you. Until you unbox that thing and put it together, you're never going to see the fullness of who you are. That happens by assembling yourselves together. Can you imagine how sad your kid would be? On a Christmas morning, you bought them a bicycle in a box. Come on, nobody wants a bicycle in a box. That's stupid. Right? Look, honey, go out and ride your bike. I can't. This seat is very uncomfortable. Honey, that's because there's no seat on the bike. <laughs> Come on, it doesn't move very well. That's because there's no wheels on the bike. Come on, a lot of us, we're just in that still, in that infant stage where we're still uh, uh, boxed up. And you haven't gotten around people who will unleash your potential. Come on, that's what the church is about. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says that you would assemble yourselves together and stir each other up. Say, look, man, you got a couple of nuts loose. Let me help you. <laughs> Come on, Zach, your elevator don't go to the top floor. Let me help you. I'm just kidding. This would be more like it. You're a few fries short of a happy meal. I'm just kidding. You know, my dad would always say things like, you're not the sharpest tool in the, in the, in the shed or whatever. You know, uh, but when you get around people, they can sharpen you. Come on, they can say, look, you, you're riding this bike and you can't see that the wheels are out of alignment, so you're going down the road sideways. But if we just make a couple of adjustments, all of a sudden things are going to be right in line. 
You know, we, we've been going through this course on Thursday nights here. It's a closed group now, but I wish you all would have just got into it in the beginning and not dragged you all's feet. But next time you can get in. Amen. Uh, it's called In Search of Timothy. And one of the things that he talks about in this series is that when Jesus called his disciples, his main primary focus was not to call them to go preach. His main primary focus was to call them so that they would be with him. Go to Mark chapter 3, if you don't believe me. I know, keep a finger there in Acts chapter 1. But go over to Mark chapter 3. <clears throat> in verse 14. Well, we can start up in verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and he called to him those who he himself wanted. And they came to him. And now in verse 14, when he appointed the 12, look what he appointed them for. He said he appointed the 12 so that they might be with him. So a lot of times people think, well, if I just get called, if God just calls me, then he's going to send me out to do something. No, when God calls you to do something, first he's going to place you somewhere so that you're with some people that you can go do something about. Amen? And so he's not going to call you to go do something without first being with someone. Come on, this is the reason that we have the church. This is the reason that we have each other. So that we can be with each other. Come on, so Jesus wanted to be with them. Come on, his secondary reason was to send them out to preach. We see this example all through the book of Acts now, in Acts chapter 1. Jesus was big on assembly all throughout the Gospels and now here even into the book of Acts in Acts chapter 1. It says in verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. In verse 5, he says, now, uh, uh, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So we see a subsequent baptism in the Holy Spirit. When you receive God, come on, you receive Him and He fills you with Himself. But now here, Jesus is telling the disciples and the apostles, listen, you need to stay here till you are uh, 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 filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. I think it's interesting how a lot of the church today, except for you know, some Calvinist beliefs or, or some, some certain people groups in the church, say that we need to go out and we need to evangelize. Come on, we need to share the love of Jesus with people. We need to see people getting saved. But they don't talk about the power that enables you to be the best witness that you can be. Come on, I don't want to just be going out in my own power and trying to be a good witness for God. I want to be going out in His power and being a witness for Him. And so in verse 8, he says, now, you shall receive power. Come on, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. And so you fast forward, you go down, you see they, they join this prayer meeting in this upper room. It's interesting, you know, I'm not going to get into it today, but it said that they continued in one accord and prayer and supplication with the women. Come on, the women were already there having church before the guys showed up. <laughs> and so now 120 people in a room changed the course of church history for eternity. In chapter 2, he said, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, in verse 1, chapter 2 and verse 1, the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord. Say one accord. one accord. He's not talking about a Honda. He's talking about being together, united together. So they were following after the example that Jesus had already been put in place, and he said, I want you to be with me. 
After I go, don't just go depart and do whatever you want to do. Stay in one accord. Stay in unity. Stay in one place. In verse 2, he says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them as divided tongues as of fire and sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and it began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now you need to notice, this is not something that you do in your own ability. Well, some people, they say, I just want to, I want to do that, I want to do that, but I don't know how to do that. Come on, it's not you doing it. Just yield that yapper to the Father. <laughs> You know how to yield the yapper when your dog gets out of line. Come on, learn how to yield the yapper. Something's got to start with your mouth. There was power that came through that room. That, that word power, when it says that the Holy Spirit came upon them, it said that they would receive power. It comes from the Greek word uh, uh, dunamis, which is where we get our word dynamic or dynamite or dynamo, all these things that talk about power. It's a strength power. It's an ability. B.B. Hankins, Pastor Mark's dad, used to say this. He goes, uh, the Holy Spirit is a genius. And if you listen to him, he'll make you look smart. <laughs> Come on, there is an ability that's been placed on the inside of you when you've been filled with the Spirit that is an ability beyond your ability. Another uh, uh, definition of this power is, is, is it's an, an inherent power, a power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. Come on, your nature has been changed. When you received Jesus, you received a new nature. And so everything in that new nature has been put in you, including the power of God. A power for performing miracles. A moral power and excellence of soul. The power and the influence which belongs to riches and wealth. Power and resource arising from numbers. Power consisting in or resting upon armies or forces or hosts. And so uh, here, after they had been filled with the Spirit, I'm sure they were looking around and said, now what are we going to do now? Hey, Peter, you were pretty close with Jesus. <laughs> Why don't you go out there and explain to everybody what's happening? You know, I think it's interesting how some people translate this chapter too. They say, well, you know, they were speaking in tongues that were known because everybody heard them in their own city. How many know they were, they were speaking in tongues that they didn't know what they were saying, but people down in the streets knew what they were saying. And so we also see that the Apostle Paul talked about a tongues of men and a tongues of angels. Because I don't know anybody who's got a dictionary on the tongues of angels. So you might say, this just sounds like a bunch of malarkey. This sounds crazy to me. There were probably people that day, of course it says that they were. There were people hearing them and hearing what was going on and saying, are these people drunk? What is going on there? Now, I used to use this example. Anytime I'm walking down a school hall and I'm in the uh, language wing of a, of a school hall and I hear the teacher, one teacher, you know, teaching in French, another teacher's teaching in Spanish, another teacher, you know, teaching in Swahili or whatever else they teach in schools, you know, maybe some teaching uh, English, you know, because some of us need to learn English again, praise the Lord, you know, and teaching all these uh, uh, languages and I'm walking down the hall and I'm like, my God, what are these teachers drinking this early in the morning? Are they a bunch of drunks in this school? I mean, you know, that's not what I was thinking. I was thinking, well, they know how to speak in a different language. So what else was going on in this room? There must have been some kind of joy going on. There must have been some kind of party sound going on. There must have been some shouting going on. Come on, there must have been something going on that would make it feel like a, a, a party was happening. Y'all hear me? Come on. And he got up there and he said, listen, these people aren't drunk like you think they are right now. It's only the third hour of the day. And some of you would say to that, well, you don't know who my family is. Uh, 
Oh, bless the Lord. <laughs> Third hour. <laughs> we wake up drunker than we went to sleep. Peter explains this, and he says, it's going to come to pass in the last days. How many of y'all believe that we're there? Come on, we're seeing it just like the days of Noah, where people are calling good evil. They're calling evil good. Come on, all these things, that they're, they're just messed up. We're in the last of the last days. He says, this is what's going to come to pass in the last days. I'm going to pour out of my spirit onto all flesh. Say all flesh. That means the person that you're sitting next to, he's pouring out on that person. The person that's on the other side of you, he's pouring out on that person. He says, your, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants, on my maid servants, I'm going to pour up my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. Now he goes on to preach a very bold message. He preached Jesus and the cross and the resurrection from the dead. He preached Jesus ascended. He preached the Holy Spirit coming through like a wind. He preached all these things to the people. And he said, you need to repent. You need to turn and choose Jesus. Some people are afraid to preach like that today. They say, well, we don't want to offend anybody because if we tell them that they've got to change, they're not going to like us. Can you imagine, Peter, though, some of the things that was going through his head that day? Well, okay, they just told me to preach. Let's see, 50 days ago, I just cussed out a little girl because she said that I, I was the Jesus. You know, not too long before that, I chopped off somebody's ear. It's really going for his head, but I'm a terrible swordsman. You know, uh, <laughs> You know, I, I don't want to grow up and live on a farm because I hate roosters. You know, all these things that were going through his head. <laughs> like, why does he hate roosters? Well, because Jesus said before that rooster would crow three times, you'd already deny me. You know, or before he even crows that in the morning, you'd already deny me three times. And so here he was. He didn't go up there and give all these excuses like he's in an AA meeting. <laughs> Hi. My name's Peter. And I'm a recovering Christ follower. Come on. He just went up there and he said, listen, this is what Jesus has done for me. And he'll do the same thing for you. <laughs> and that day, look at this, man, in, in verse uh, 41. He said, those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. <laughs> do you notice they gladly received the word? It's interesting that the writer of Acts says that they gladly received because there must have been some people who weren't so glad about the word that was preached. And maybe they didn't gladly receive, but they still could have uh, angrily received. <laughs> I've preached some messages and they'll, somebody will come up to me and say, you know, Pastor, I'm going to go home and think about that one for a while. Because they were angry about what I was saying. But then there's other people that will come up, same message. Say, my goodness, that was the best message I've ever heard on such and such. Well, praise the Lord. Come on, one person can gladly receive it. One person just gets grumpy because they know I just called them out there on the carpet. <laughs> but look, they were praising God in verse 47. And they were having favor with all of the people. <laughs> Doesn't mean just believers here. There was favor with everybody. And the Lord added daily to the church those who were being saved. How I many you know without the power of God on Peter's life, he would have just said, man, I just hate chickens and I don't even want to be here. But with the power of God, come on, a whole city was changed. A whole nation was changed. And it spread from there. This power is to do what God has called you to do. Now go over to Acts chapter 3. Yesterday, you know, we were at breakfast, and Brother Gary starts sharing around these same lines. And I just said, I'm about to slap that man. He's going to preach my whole message. I had it on paper. I can show you the date. 
Uh, so I'm not copying what he said, but he, yeah, aren't you just thankful for Gary and Danny? They're just a blessing to the body. Amen. <laughs> Such an encouragement to us and, and to this body. Thank you for being who you are. Uh, Acts chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, Now Peter and John went up together in the temple of the hour of prayer about the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask for alms from those who entered the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. And so he gave them his attention expecting to receive something from them. I just love Peter's answer. He said, Peter, uh, uh, Peter said, silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have, come on, a lot of times we as the church are focused on what we don't have instead of focus on what we do have. Come on, if you focus on what you do have, then what you don't have will come in. Come on, we have something. He says, what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus. And he says, uh, uh, Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand. And he lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength so that he leaping up. Come on, somebody. This wasn't just a healing. It was a miracle. Amen. This man had been laying there every day. There's a chance even that Jesus walked by this guy before. Think about that. You think about everywhere that Jesus went, he healed somebody. Jesus could have walked into this same temple, and that guy was not ready to receive that day. But Peter and John redirected his attention and he said, listen, you're focusing on the wrong thing. He says immediately, his feet and his ankle bones received strength so that he leaping up, he stood and he walked and he entered into the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people now, come on, all these people that were sitting in there, they saw him walking and praising God, and it, they knew that it was him who was sitting there begging for alms at the gate beautiful. And they were all filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Everywhere that they went, there was a unity and a power and a one accordness, if you will. They were all together in one accord. And even if they got separated for some reason, here's one of the reasons they got separated. Peter and John preaching Jesus, the, the religious people and the rulers of that day said, I don't want to hear any more about this Jesus character. We just had him on the earth for three years. We heard all his stories. We don't want to hear anything about him anymore. Come on, he didn't shut them up. It didn't shut them up. So then in Acts chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, Now when they spoke to the people, the priests of the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on him. How I many you know they weren't laying on hands on him for healing? They laid hands on him to take him in. They laid hands on him and put them into custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But look what God can do. However, many of those who heard the word believed. <laughs> and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So all this Pentecost experience is continuing even into these next few weeks. 3,000 people saved, 5,000 people saved. You know, today, if a preacher gets arrested, it is all over the news. And most people will run from that preacher. What did this church do in the early church? They got together and they said, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Come on, these uh, religious folk, they tried to stop what the Holy Ghost was doing, but he can't be stopped. Come on, he can't be stopped. If we still believe that we're supposed to go witness to people, we need to still believe that we need to be filled with the Spirit to do it right. In verse 13, chapter 4, he said, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. What a compliment. What a compliment, an awesome compliment for Peter and John to have the world recognize that they had been with Jesus. 
Come on, when our thoughts and our words and our actions become Christ-like and the people that we meet, uh, uh, they will recognize that too, that we have been with Jesus. But the only way that we're going to be like Jesus is by spending time with Jesus. <laughs> by spending time with Jesus. And so they prayed. And here in verse 23 now, go down a little bit in chapter 4. He says, and being let go, they went to their own companions. They went back to the church. They went back to their own company. This same company that Jesus said, I'm gonna, I want to be with you. They were together in one accord, one place. They went back to the people. And they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to, him, uh, said to them. And when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. Come on, they were saying the same thing at the same time. You notice it says they raised their voice. It doesn't say that they raised their voices. Come on, what is a holy roar? It's a one united sound coming out of a united church. I was in a prayer meeting one time when we were ministering up in Alaska. And uh, it was just an interesting prayer meeting. There was no unity in the prayer meeting. I remember this one guy just kept going around, and he would just be looking at doors and laying hands on the door. Now, the door is an inanimate object. <laughs> Come on, it opens when you turn it closes when you pull it. Meanwhile, you know, we're praying for, I don't even know what we're praying for that night. I was just kind of distracted by this guy praying for weird things in the church. There was no holy roar coming out of that. Just everybody praying whatever way they want to pray. Kind of like a spider web of prayers. But you know, when you lift up a, a, a holy roar together, there's a united sound. There's a united voice. Come on, this is why corporate prayer is so important. It's interesting that a lot of the church says, I need more power, I need more power, and you don't come around to the place where the power is poured out. Come on, prayer happens by being around people who know how to pray. Come on, you learn how to pray, and you, you pull on the gifts that God has put in your life, and they will help you in teaching you how to pray. I remember when I moved to California, and I was really, uh, uh, really trying to just kind of disappear. And uh, we went to a prayer meeting. They had prayer meetings every Thursday night right down on the beach in Santa Barbara. And I walk in there, and I go, my goodness, these people are praying differently than I've ever heard praying before. Now, I grew up in a spirit-filled church, spirit-filled house. I heard a lot of praying in all different kinds of ways. But I'd never heard a church pray that united. No, it wasn't just, well, let's get together. Here's my prayer request. Here's your prayer request. I've got three unspokens. <laughs> Come on, it was like, man, we're going to let the Spirit lead this prayer. And it was a holy sound that came out of that prayer. We've had other opportunities where, you know, even, even around here, you know, we've uh, uh, been in Fulton Montgomery Community Pastors Prayer Network or whatever it's called. And this one guy comes in, he kind of looks like a farmer or whatever, and he's always praying for the weirdest things. And it's just not, like you tell, like, not everybody's going in the same direction. Come on, not everybody's speaking the same word. You know, uh, uh, when Jesus was going around ministering, he said, listen, you need to get the unbelief out of it. A lot of t times people want to carry in their unbelief to the prayer meeting. Come on, don't carry your unbelief into this meeting. Say, so listen, I'm going to believe God that when I pray, that I'm going to believe and I'm going to receive that what I've prayed for. And I'm going to walk out of that place thanking God for what he's already done. They were in one accord. And they started praying for boldness in verse 29. He says, now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants with all boldness that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done by, uh, uh, through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place 
where they were assembled. Come on, this is where we get together. This is where we start to tweak each other a little bit. We start to turn uh, 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 screws that are loose a little bit and say, listen, this will just be so much better if you get this in alignment. There's a place of assembly that they were together. The whole place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they started to, uh, they spoke the word of God with boldness. And so we see this is the same group of people that just got filled in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And why are they getting filled up again? I don't know about you. Y'all ever have tires that go flat in the middle of the winter? It's because the air pressure starts to go down. But you need to go back to the air hose and hose up those tires, air up those tires, and see them come back to pressure. I think a lot of us, if we were uh, uh, a walking instrument panel, like on the front of our cars, a lot of us would have our tire sign on all the time. Come on, we're trying to roll around on flat tires. We need to get back to the place where we're getting filled up. Not just once. Oh, yeah, I had that experience once in the 80s. Good for you. Come back to the filling station. Come on, every Monday night, I encourage you to come here for a time of chapel. There is praying in the Spirit. There are some filled people with the Spirit in this place. You say, I don't know about all that stuff. You know what, man? You can't do it without it. If Jesus said it was going to be to our advantage that he goes away because he could send the helper to us. He could send the comforter to us. Uh, The church ought not be powerless. Come on, I don't want this place to be known as a country club. I'm not here to golf with you. I'm not here to drink with you. I'm not here to smoke with you. I'm here to see the power of God made in demonstration. I'm here to see people come in one way and leave drastically and radically changed. Now, if you want to eat with me, that's a different story. <laughs> now, what happens after this besides just an earthquake? We see what happens in Acts chapter 5. I'm almost done. You got five minutes? I'm almost done. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 12, he says, Through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all in one accord. Come on, they were in unity, in one place. They were in the right place at the right time, serving the right Jesus with the right people surrounding them. He says in verse 14, he said, And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And so that they brought out the sick into the streets, they laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. And a multitude gathered from surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And they were all healed. Jesus never had a day where he walked by somebody and his shadow healed them. But here's Peter, somebody who was chosen by Jesus. Peter, somebody who who Jesus said, listen, man, will you just come and be with me? Come assemble yourself together with me. Peter, I know it's not always going to be the popular thing to do what we're doing together. Come on, some of us, we just want to be popular. I don't care about popularity at all. I'm not here to be popular. I'm not here to win you with my personality. I've got a great personality, by the way, but I'm not here to win you with that. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Well, these apostles, these disciples, they went through some garbage. They went through some persecution. How many of us, would, uh, you know, if we were to go out into the street and all of a sudden Mayor Dayton King declares that no longer can you talk about Jesus in the city of Gloversville and GPD starts to arrest people and you say, well, I guess that's it. Go find the next best thing. Come on, that's not what these guys did. They said, no way. No way. We're bold before, but Holy Spirit, we're asking you now for even more. (laughs) Come on, we were bold to speak your word before. We were loud before. They thought we were drunk before. Come on, they've seen miracles before, but we're asking for even more. (laughs) Come on, we're in the last days. His Spirit is being poured out on us. You know, these guys started to learn something. That, uh, wow, the power of God is greater than any chain, any shackle, any bondage that we put on these guys. 
So another time that, that Peter got arrested, they took him away with 16 guys around him. The Bible says four squads of soldiers. There was four soldiers in each squad, 16 guys around a guy wearing a dress <laughs> or a robe, you know. I'm going to start wearing a dress or a robe. I mean, a robe. Not like that, you know. I'm going to wear a robe. Uh, come on, 16 guys. 16. But look what happened for, from the church in Acts chapter 12. I'm almost done, I promise. Acts chapter 12 and verse 5, he says, Peter was therefore kept in prison. But constant prayer. Say constant prayer. Come on, constant prayer means you just keep on praying. Well, how do I pray when I'm at the job? Well, you can pray in the spirit. <laughs> what an idea that the Lord would give you an ability to pray and not distract anybody. Come on. <laughs> the apostle Paul said, listen, I pray more than all y'all put together. Constant prayer was being offered to God for him by the church. Now, this must have been some kind of crazy prayer meeting because uh, 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 while they were praying, the angel of the Lord stood by him in verse 7, and a light shone into that prison. <laughs> and he struck Peter on the side. This is the way I should start waking up Ruth. Praise the Lord. Uh, my goodness, she's hard to wake up sometimes. <laughs> you know, I go in there, you, do, you, know, you know, you try to be all sweet with the kids and say, come on, baby. I wake up, sweetie pie. Ah, and she just pulls the covers over her head. <laughs> Is that maybe what Peter was trying to do? The angel of the Lord first came in and said, Come on, Petey. It's time to wake up, Peter. Come on, buddy. It's going to be all right. Come, come on. And he said he struck him in the side <laughs> and raised him up. And he said, Look it, bro. you got to wake up. Your chains are already off of you. The angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. He's like, what's going on here? My goodness, it's bright in here. Did they change the wattage of the light bulb? My gosh, I can't see anything. Uh, put your shoes on, you weirdo. <laughs> the next statement was, dude, you can't go out there naked. Put your clothes on. <laughs> and follow me. Now, in verse 9, he says, so he went out and he followed the angel, and he didn't know uh, that what was done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened up on its own accord. <laughs> it opened up of its own accord because they were in one accord, and they were praying for his delivery. Come on, a group that was in one accord made a gate open on its own accord. And so then they went out, and they, and they went down one street, and immediately the angel of the Lord departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now, I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod and from the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had uh, considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where they were gathered together praying. Come on, they were assembled together praying. They were in one accord praying. And as Peter knocked on the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And she recognized Peter's voice, but because of her gladness, she didn't open up the gate. What a weirdo. How long y'all been praying? It's constant prayer. And finally God does something. <laughs> She was so happy. And she ran in. She announced that Peter stood before the gate. Now, we think Rhoda's nuts, but the people inside are even crazier. They said, Rhoda, you're out of your mind. It's only his ghost. <laughs> it's his angel. Let's keep praying. No, it really is. It's really me. It's really me out here. Get me in there before they find me. <laughs> Come on, we got to believe that when we pray that something is actually happening. 
we got to believe that when we start coming together in one accord and in one voice, that God is seeing that come up before him. That we're not praying spiderweb prayers, but it is like a geyser flowing up from the earth to heaven, touching heaven, and heaven coming down to earth, touching earth. We see something happen because of how we're praying. Now, we need to be committed to the church. Y'all ever seen that video? Well, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. Well, people who love the Lord should love what he loves. Come on, he loves his church. We need to learn how to love one another and hold each other in highest regard in spite of our faults and our flaws. Come on, the church is the body of Christ. And if we wouldn't do it to Jesus, come on, we shouldn't do it to our fellow members in the church. I'm not just talking about Love City. I'm talking about the body of Christ. You know, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 11, verse 22. He said, have faith in God. He said, assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed be cast into the sea and doesn't doubt in his heart but believes that those things which he says will be done he will have whatever he says remember Jesus talked about if you would only believe all things are possible for those who believe in this verse he only says believe once he's talking about what we're saying three times as much as what we're talking about as far as our heart goes he goes on to say in verse 24 therefore I say to you whatever things you ask when you pray believe that you receive them and you will have them. Hallelujah. 